after my colleague from Calgary. Um, her work on the Canada-US file and on the border in particular has been impor very important. Um, I'm also very happy to, to stand in this place. As many MPs have said this week, Mr. Speaker, this is likely my last uh, speech in this place. I know uh, many of my friends, including my friend from Winnipeg, is probably happy about that, but I'm going to resume my speaking uh, pace in the new chamber, Mr. Speaker. I can guarantee him of that, as I know he will. We all respect this institution and this chamber and the history it represents, and whether I agree with my friends on the other side or not, I respect their ability and their freedom to make their case, uh, often a bad one, but it's making their case to Canadians because this is their chamber. And I know that uh, some of my constituents may be watching today, Canadians watching at home or online. Uh, please know that we may disagree, but let's try and do it uh, without being disagreeable. And to let you know that even though the member from Winnipeg North will uh, ask me a question full of bombast after my, my remarks, uh, I respect him nonetheless, Mr. Speaker. This is a unique occasion given the the frequency of the Senate now to send back amendments. This is probably the first time I've spoken on a bill for the third time, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, that's probably quite normal for the Deputy House Leader of the Liberals, but this is the third time I'm speaking on C21, which was actually introduced in June of 2016 with its companion bill, C23, the Preclearance Act. I've spoken on both. Uh, I worked on cross-border trade as a, as a lawyer, Mr. Speaker, in the private sector. And I was the public safety critic when this parliament began, Mr. Speaker. And I've raised a number of concerns with respect to the legislation, but that our general support was there for the entry and exit sharing of information with the U.S. that is represented in the Customs Act. The amendments specifically from the Senate that bring, is bringing us to debate this before the end of session, Mr. Speaker, relates to something that I actually raised in my September 2017 speech on Bill C-21. In, in fact, my concerns about information sharing and the storage of that information that's going to be collected uh, about Canadians leaving the country and coming back, I was concerned about just the implications of that vast amount of personal data. So I'm actually quite happy there's more certainty uh, being suggested by the Senate with respect to retention of that data, limiting it to 15 years, Mr. Speaker. Um, I raised that, as I said, in September 2017. That's why I support the Senate amendment, and I'm happy to speak to that um, today in the House. It's an example of actually both Houses of Parliament working the way they can, Mr. Speaker, making the bill better. So this is a rare occasion where I'm supportive of the, both the legislation originally and the amendment from the Senate. Now, it wouldn't be fair for me as a representation of my time and my six years in this chamber, Mr. Speaker. In fact, tomorrow marks six years to the day since I was escorted into this chamber as a by-election winner. I'm getting the golf clap from a few of my Liberal friends, and uh, I'll, I'll take that over heckles any day, Mr. Speaker. But it's a very special day for me. I spoke about that uh, on the radio last week. The 12th day of the 12th month of 2012, Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister Harper and Jim Flaherty, a close family friend of our family, led me into the House as a new by-election winner. I took my seat in the rump, Mr. Speaker, and I've tried to make a difference ever since. And so to be true to form for me in my last speech, especially 20-minute speech, uh, sorry to inform my Liberal friends of that fact, uh, in this chamber, I'd be remiss if I wasn't somewhat partisan. And pointed to wider issues that should concern Canadians with respect to the Customs Act changes. Because as I said, Bill C-21 and C-23, its companion bill, have been with us since June 2016. So the fact they're rushing it through with, with time allocation and debate and, and pushing it through in the final days shows we're almost in 2019. This is almost two and a half years this legislation has sort of languished in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it shows there's efficiency problems with this government. But what I'm going to devote my remarks to is actually what Canadians should be asking when it comes to our border. C-21 and C-23 were profound changes to the way Canada and U.S. have our borders operating. C-23 
is the preclearance bill, which allows American ICE officials, Immigration and Custom Enforcement Officers, to search Canadians on Canadian soil, Mr. Speaker. Probably would shock a lot of Canadians, and to do preclearance. Now, that will work in many cases to speed up the border, which is why we supported it. Bill C-21 is entry and exit sharing of information, Mr. Speaker. Also something quite unparalleled, which is why data protection measures is bringing this debate back to the floor of the House of Commons. So the most substantial additions to the relationship between the United States in a generation, Mr. Speaker, and a slight erosion of sovereignty, Mr. Speaker. Now, that can be a good thing if Canada is getting more in return as a re in, in response to this, but it can also be something we pause about. These elements were part of the Beyond the Border initiative, which I worked on in the Harper government as Parliamentary Secretary for International Trade, Mr. Speaker, so I do support these measures. But let's watch and see how the Liberals have allowed the Canada-U.S. relationship to atrophy terribly in the three years of the Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. The Minister for Public Safety, then the MP for Regina Wiscana, in February 2011, with his appropriate degree of outrage, said this to Prime Minister Harper, I quote, could the Prime Minister at least guarantee minimum gains for Canada? For example, will he get rid of U.S. country of origin labeling? End quote, Mr. Speaker. He went on to also say, are we going to get softwood protections? Are the Americans going to eliminate Buy American? What was the Minister of Public Safety demanding at that time? He wanted some clear wins for Canada if we were to give up the entry and exit information, Mr. Speaker. So the exact element of Bill C-21, when it was being contemplated by the Harper government, the Liberals said, wait a minute, before we accede to this American request, what is Canada going to get in return? That's what their most senior member of Cabinet said, Mr. Speaker. Diplomatic relations, even with our closest friend, trading partner and ally are a give and take. It's not just be taken or give, give, give and nothing in return. At the time, the member from Regina, Wiscana wanted to see Canada gain, whether it was with the unfair country of origin labeling or other elements of our complex trade relationship, Mr. Speaker. So we have C-21 and C-23 allowing the Americans to inspect and search Canadians on our own soil. What have we gained? Absolutely nothing, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, under this Prime Minister's watch, the U.S. relationship have, has atrophied beyond all recognition, Mr. Speaker. And it's not just because of the current occupant of the White House. So I'm going to spend a few minutes exploring that, exploring what the public safety minister demanded. Where are the wins for Canada as we allow more and more American intrusion on decisions related to customs and the border, Mr. Speaker. In November 2015, President Obama, with a new Liberal Prime Minister in office, cancelled the Keystone XL pipeline, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the Keystone XL pipeline was one of the reasons Prime Minister Harper was reticent to pass entry and exit uh, information sharing, Mr. Speaker. We wanted that quid pro quo. We wanted the Americans to approve a pipeline to once again try and get better market prices, more market access for our resources, something we're struggling with as a country right now, Mr. Speaker. So we were withholding this element of what was a priority for the U.S. in terms of foreign policy to try and secure a win. The Prime Minister caved within months. In fact, his quote at the time, he was disappointed. Later, he introduced President Obama in this chamber as his his bromance, dude-diplomacy, dude he said at the time, was the relationship between them. Well, it was a one-way relationship. Now, he got a state dinner on March 11, 2016, Mr. Speaker, where at, the, at that state dinner, the Prime Minister said, we're closer than friends. What else did he announce the same day in Washington, Mr. Speaker? Our Prime Minister, with zero consultation with Indigenous and territorial leaders, agreed to ban future development on 17% of the Arctic lands and 10% of Arctic waters, Mr. Speaker. No consultation whatsoever 
pure surrender to what President Obama wanted to do in his final months in office, Mr. Speaker. Once again, a one-way relationship. Let's look and see what the longest-serving Inuk Liberal Senator said about that, Mr. Speaker. Retired Senator Charlie Watt, when I asked him about the Prime Minister's unilateral action, he said this, quote, there have never been clear consultations. He went on to say, the federal government said, this is what's going to happen. Is that consultations, Mr. Speaker? When a respected uh, Inuk leader, former Senate colleague of some of the Liberal MPs, is basically told by the government what's going to happen. Territorial premiers said they were given an hour or so heads up on the announcement by Canada's Prime Minister in Washington, Mr. Speaker. So under President Obama, the Prime Minister is giving up the entry and exit priority the Americans had been asking for years, bringing in C-23 pre-clearance. We lost Keystone, and we eroded our own sovereignty and that of our Inuit and Inuk people in our north, Mr. Speaker. Two huge losses under the first uh, president in relationship with this Prime Minister. The same day I asked retired Senator Watt, there was an Aboriginal law expert at committee, Mr. Speaker, and I asked her, did the Prime Minister violate the country's duty to consult Indigenous Canadians as dictated by the Supreme Court of Canada? Robin Camp Campbell, her answer was, I quote, the simple answer is yes, Mr. Speaker. He's also breached this duty to consult when he cancelled the Northern Gateway pipeline, Mr. Speaker. There are many instances where the Prime Minister's posturing and kind words on reconciliation are not matched by his actions. And I'd like to see more accountability for that. And in fact, I invite Canadians to look at the Globe and Mail yesterday, Chief Fox's column saying on Bill C-69, the anti-pipeline bill, there's been no consultations. So really nice language, bad actions, Mr. Speaker. So those are the first two elements of a declining Canada-US relationship under the first president, President Obama. What has it been since? We now have the legalization of cannabis, really the only promise the Liberals have kept from their 2015 election platform. But the Prime Minister, despite the state dinner, despite acceding to many Canadian demands, he could not even get the Americans to remove one question from the pre-clearance screening on that side of the border, the marijuana question. And a lot of Canadians should be concerned now that if you're asked that question, you could lose the ability to travel to the United States, impacting people's economic uh, ability to, to pursue job or go to the United States because of work, impairing their freedom of movement, Mr. Speaker. All we needed to do was to get assurance from the federal U.S. government that Immigration and Custom Enforcement, ICE, would not ask that question. We couldn't even get them to remove one question from a list, Mr. Speaker. And with Bill C-23, the companion bill, we're allowing Americans to search Canadians on Canadian soil. It's, it is a one-way relationship that Canadians should be concerned about. That issue was both under President Obama and now under President Trump, Mr. Speaker, because it took some time for the Liberals to complete their legalization of, of cannabis, Mr. Speaker. That was one of the concerns the Conservatives held out from day one. The border issue, make sure that's resolved with the Americans. We could not get that assurance, Mr. Speaker. Let's look at NORAD, Mr. Speaker. Had we started talking about security at the time that there was missile testing by North Korea, the Conservatives urged the Liberals to complete our full NORAD security partnership, Mr. Speaker, making sure that we're a partner on ballistic missile defense. That would have, in the early days of the President Trump time in the White House, shown Canada as the only trade and security partner with the United States, period. Through NORAD, we have a North American defense and have since the 1950s. And since the 1965 Auto Pact, only Canada has a trade and integrated security relationship with the United States, which is why we could have been able to avoid Section 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum, which I'll get into later, Mr. Speaker. But we missed an opportunity to actually show a partnership with the United States at a time was, that was critical. What did we do instead, Mr. Speaker? 
The Liberals postured in front of the new U.S. President, putting up non-binding criteria for the negotiation of NAFTA, the progressive agenda, to play politics rather than to get down to business with the Americans, Mr. Speaker. So the border and the cannabis question, NORAD, those are three and four where the relationship has declined. I would also mention the Safe Third Country Agreement, Mr. Speaker. We've had my colleague from Calgary, Nose Hill, talk about the 40,000 people that have illegally crossed borders in Manitoba and Quebec claiming asylum when the government knows the vast majority have no substantive asylum claim. They actually have status in the United States. The minister did not even for the first year or more talk to the U.S. about amendments to close the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement an agreement negotiated by the previous Liberal government of Jean Chrétien. Once again, they didn't want to interfere with the Prime Minister's tweet rather than fix the system, Mr. Speaker. In fact, it's interesting because the Minister of Public Safety in February 2011 called entry and exit change with the Americans. He called it a surrender of sovereignty. He said, Mr. Speaker, if we have common entry and common exit system, does it not follow that Canada no longer has sovereign control, Canadian control over immigration and refugees?" End quote, Mr. Speaker. This is their minister saying that when the Conservative government considered entry and exit visa, Mr. Speaker. Well, this government's inaction and incompetence at the border has surrendered our sovereign control of it, Mr. Speaker, at a time when they're also going around the world saying that their model should be a best practice used by the world, Mr. Speaker. Canadian confidence in their handling of our system has eroded terribly, Mr. Speaker. That's probably the worst of their failures in our time, Mr. Speaker, is allowing Canadian confidence to go down through their own inaction. Finally, with respect to tariffs, Mr. Speaker, and NAFTA in general, we were given a one-way take-it-or-leave-it deal. For two months, the United States and Mexico were at the negotiation table, and Canada wasn't. Mexico had played the relationship and, and the negotiation much more strategically than us. There was too much politics by this Prime Minister and his minister, and we were given a take-it-or-leave-it deal where we lost on all fronts, Mr. Speaker. There is no win in NAFTA. And when it comes to tariffs, when I spoke for the second time on this bill in, in March, uh, in May, sorry, of 2017, I believe, May of 2018, I had warned the Prime Minister that tariffs were on the way. In fact, when Canada was granted a temporary retrieve, reprieve from steel and aluminum tariffs, March 11th, the Prime Minister said this when he was touring steel communities, quote, as long as there is a free trade deal in North America, there won't be tariffs, end quote. Well, I guess he broke that one. He went on to say, we had your backs last week and always will. That was in March. In May, in debate on C-21, I warned the Prime Minister that tariffs were coming because the Americans did not take our security considerations over supply of steel from China seriously, Mr. Speaker. And sadly, in June, the U.S. unfairly applied tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum, Mr. Speaker sending our economy into a tailspin in manufacturing in Southern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, leading eventually to what we see as GM and a crisis of confidence in manufacturing, in part because the retaliatory tariffs they brought in are not hurting the Americans, they're hurting many of our suppliers. So as I said, C-21 and C-23 were a wholesale surrender to U.S. demands with respect to customs and pre-clearance. And as the Minister of Public Safety demanded in 2011, Canada, for giving up these elements, should gain something. We have not gained, Mr. Speaker. I'll review for Canadians. Keystone, the Arctic ban, the cannabis question for the border, NORAD partnerships, the safe third country loophole, steel and aluminum tariffs, and a take-it-or-leave-it NAFTA, Mr. Speaker. So as I said at the outset, while I support C-21 and the amendments, Canadians need to know that the Canada-U.S. relationship, which is critical, 
is not a one-way street where the Americans get what they want and we get nothing. It's about time we see the Prime Minister and his minister stand up for Canadian interests in return for Bill C-21. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Oakville. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And just before I pose my question to the member, um, this is probably my last time rising in this chamber to speak. It's been an incredible honour to stand in, in, this, uh, in this space uh, and be part of this history and be part of the debates in the House. And I wanted to say a huge thank you to uh, the residents of Oakville for giving me the honour and the opportunity to represent them here in this place before we move to our new temporary quarters. My question to the Honourable Member is, uh, the Senate made one amendment to Clause 2 allowing the Canadian Border Security to keep records for 15 years. Canada, unlike most countries, does not collect information about people leaving Canada. This will improve our ability to prevent people from traveling overseas to join terrorist groups, combat human trafficking, re respond to Amber Alerts, and ensure the, the integrity of our social benefit programs that require a residency in Canada. Does he, in the end, I've heard a lot of discussion from him today in his 20 minutes, does he support this bill? Thank you. The Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Oakville, and maybe he came in late. I did start with my first minute saying I supported the bill and the amendments, and in fact, the Senate amendments took into consideration uh, my suggestions from September 2017 with respect to retention and storage of personal information. What I'm going to use the remainder of my answer, Mr. Speaker, is to tell the member about a concerning meeting I had at the Oakville Chamber of Commerce at the beginning of the summer when we had our Cana Saving Canadian Jobs Tour, Mr. Speaker. The tariffs being imposed, not just by the U.S., but by the tariffs in his government on U.S. Uh, imports into Canada, Mr. Speaker, are crippling small to medium-sized enterprises. In fact, Mr. Speaker, an accountant from Oakville showed up at my meeting and said the only work he has done for clients, privately held businesses, employers in the Oakville Halton region, was arranging their affairs to move investments to the United States, Mr. Speaker. It is concerning the uncompetitiveness that we see across the country from the West with C-69 to tariffs in Southern Ontario are concerning. I would ask this member to use his last caucus meeting tomorrow in the hallowed room that they do it in to demand that the Prime Minister start taking competitiveness seriously, to demand that businesses in Oakville remain as competitive as they had been to make sure they're still part of North American supply chains at the end of this year, Mr. Speaker. Questions and commentaries? Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Kitchener-Conestoga. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for his fantastic command of this, this, these files, especially as it relates to trade, Mr. Speaker. And one of the issues, he, he outlined a number of failures of this government as it relates to trade, but one of the issues he didn't have time to get to, Mr. Speaker, was the issue of giving up our sovereignty to the, of the dairy industry in the USMCA. Mr. Speaker, I spent a lot of time on the phone this morning, actually, with two farmers from my area who are very concerned about this one this one part of uh, giving up our sovereignty. So again, our Prime Minister has capitulated to President Trump on so many issues. But Mr. Speaker, my question really relates to this bill and the hypocrisy of the government in bringing in this bill, which we support, which increases the safety and security of Canadians, but at the same time welcoming 38 to 40,000 illegal migrants across the border in Quebec with virtually no safety measures in place to actually guarantee that for Canadians. I wonder if my colleague could comment on that hypocrisy, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank uh, my colleague from Kitchener-Conestoga. I know how uh, well regarded he is by the small businesses, by the farming families in his community, and that he is always listening. And I agree with him. Um, I heard from Robert Larmer from, the, from my writing just last week, Mr. Speaker, concerns that in the final days towards the signing ceremony on the new NAFTA, USMCA, the U.S. were still making unilateral changes to the agreement, Mr. Speaker. In fact, let's recall the Prime Minister threatened that he wouldn't show up for the photo op for NAFTA unless tariffs were removed. Well, last I checked, Mr. Speaker, tariffs are still in place. And removing himself from, the, from a photo op, that's the nuclear option for this Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker because photo ops are his key priority. 
What we don't see as a priority are farming families who, when we did make changes to supply management with CETA and with the negotiation of TPP, we worked in unison with our families to provide certainty on timelines and market access, Mr. Speaker. Right now, we see agriculture uncertain about access and, in fact, giving up access for nothing in return. As I said, the, the U.S. relationship under this Prime Minister, since Obama through to Trump, on security, on the border, on trade, on everything, has been a one-way relationship. We have given and received nothing in return because we're not seen as serious. When we go down and say that our priorities for NAFTA are non-binding issues, non-binding. The minister didn't even mention the auto industry, Mr. Speaker, in her priority speech at the University of Ottawa. We would not have free trade in North America without the Auto Pact of 1965, Mr. Speaker. We didn't even mention it. It's no wonder that with tariffs, trade, payroll taxes, carbon taxes, GM and other manufacturers are leaving, Mr. Speaker. The one solution is called Election 2019. Questions and comments? Question come on there, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, it's always interesting listening to my colleague across the way. Uh, he has as entertaining as a, probably a more appropriate uh, word. You know, we're talking about C-51. We understand the Conservatives support it. They've considered it, supported it in first reading, second reading committee, uh, third reading. They supported it in the Senate. They support the amendment. That's all clear, Mr. Speaker. The other thing that's clear is the Conservatives, if they could, they would spend the rest of the year, this year and next year, talking about C-51, uh, Mr. Speaker. But you listen to the content of the well, member across the way. He wants to talk about trade. Well, let's talk about trade. This is a government that actually got a trade agreement when a year ago they were capitulating, Mr. Speaker, because they were concerned that we wouldn't be able to get the trade agreement. Not only did we get a trade agreement with the U.S., we got a trade agreement with the uh, European Union. We got a trade agreement with Ukraine. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that understands the importance of trade because we understand the importance of Canada's middle class and those aspiring to be a part of it. This is a government that has delivered hundreds of thousands of jobs in the last three years by working with the industry and Canadians in every region of this country, Mr. Speaker. Proof is in the pudding. Our economy is doing better than the rest of the G8 uh, countries, Mr. Speaker, because we have good, solid, progressive policies that incorporate all sorts of positive things that have generated with Canadians so many things, Mr. Speaker. Like the member opposite, I look forward to 2019, Mr. Speaker. We on this house have a lot to talk about in 2019, and I'm anxious to continue the dialogue that we'll have in the coming months in the new chamber as we ultimately say goodbye to this beautiful, historic chamber. Uh, be, before we go to the Honourable Member from Durham, I notice a few of the newer members uh, were asking about question, and when I do get up, when the Speaker does get up, he usually asks for questions or comments, and uh, I just thought I'd uh, clarify that for the newer members who are here and uh, weren't quite sure how the rules work. The Honourable Member for Durham. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I agree with my colleague. We can have dialogue in this place, but we don't need the yelling. <laughs> Dialogue can happen, Mr. Speaker, and I predicted to the viewers at home that that honourable member would stand up with bombast in the questions and comments, and he held true to my prediction, and I still respect him as much as I promised I would, Mr. Speaker, even though he's still lost in the wilderness on that side. <laughs> Capitulation is a ridiculous word that they've used when they were not invited to the negotiation table, Mr. Speaker when Mexico and the United States formalized the USMCA, the new NAFTA, without Canada at the table. I'd like Canadians to think about it as all of your economic wealth, your home is being negotiated about, and you're not invited into the room, Mr. Speaker. That's how concerned manufacturers in Ontario, that's how concerned softwood lumber producers in BC have been by the incompetence of the government. Capitulation, we were wanting you to fight for jobs from the beginning. When the Minister of the Environment suggested that my uh, suggestions to focus on auto was stupid, Mr. Speaker. That crazy was her comment in a debate. I would end with this, Mr. Speaker. There's been a lot of speculation. This session started with a Liberal who lost confidence in the Liberal leader 
crossing the floor and joining the Conservatives where she's thriving. She's a great member of the team, Mr. Speaker. There's been speculation. Will it end with a similar crossing from the Liberals to the Conservatives? I want to tell the Honourable Member from Winnipeg North, I did my best, but the member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, wouldn't say yes to Kevin or for him coming over, Mr. Speaker. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Richmond Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, with uh, the Vancouver International Airport in my riding of uh, Richmond Centre, border services definitely are very important to my constituents and also to all Canadians who happen to pass my riding a lot of times. So if you don't know where Richmond Centre is, just visit the YVL. So um, my question to my honourable colleague is that all of my immigrant friends, I mean, new Canadians and Canadians who've been here for a long time, are really mad at the fact that there are so many illegal entry into our border, through our border. So I, my question is, how would you suggest or recommend that a government should do? Because this is just simply not fair that those illegal border crossers are jumping the queue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to remind the honourable members to uh, speak through the speaker and not directly, uh, to, uh, regardless of how familiar we are. The honourable member for Durham in about 35 seconds or less, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What's interesting is we've been raising the crisis of confidence, the erosion that, of confidence that Canadians have in the immigration and refugee system because of the inaction of this government. My colleague from Richmond has been a consistent voice, as has my colleague from Calgary Nose Hill. When the minister had documents in his possession warning him of a $3 billion cost and an 11-year wait time potential for Immigration and Refugee Board, Mr. Speaker, that minister told this House that the Safe Third Country Agreement was working fantastically well, Mr. Speaker. That was his comment, fantastically well. Canadians are proud of our fair, compassionate and rules-based system, Mr. Speaker. We need to get back to it. In fact, all Canadians, including new Canadians, Mr. Speaker, want us to get back to that system because they followed it. And their success here has been tremendous, Mr. Speaker. We will get back to it once again, Mr. Speaker, after election 2019. Statements by members. Déclaration de député, l'honorable député de la Pointe de Lille. Monsieur le Président, ça fait deux ans qu'Ottawa prouve son incompétence dans la gestion des migrants. Pas de plan de triage, pas de plan pour accélérer le traitement des demandeurs d'asile et les permis de travail, pas de compensation pour les 300 millions que ça coûte au Québec, 